Even as the Millennium Declaration was passed, global civil society organizations, the few parliamentarians who were gathered there, local government associations, and workers' unions were protesting outside for exclusion. This was in New York. This is because their expectation of the final moments of the crafting of a Millennium Declaration did not meet the arrangements of the 1990s that led to the Declaration. In the 1990s, if you recall, there was a series of global conferences. For the first time in a long time, these summits became spaces where leaders, governments, elected representatives, and civil society mingled almost equally to shape the outcomes. The Millennium Development Goals that were derived from the Declaration, they were de derived in a manner basically for, for pragmatic reasons. Something that would keep the development part alive and something we can measure and actually incorporate in planning. But when they were born, they were born of very difficult circumstances in Africa. This was the period in which Africa was the most indebted ever in its history. 25 years prior to the Millennium Declaration, the Millennium Summit, only in five of those 25 years did GDP growth outpace population growth. In almost every country, life expectancy had increased from the 1960 to 1980 and drastically declined from 1980-82 to 2000. It's the same results with child mortality, adult literacy, and maternal mortality. Although the MDGs, as was explained, are simply objectives, the strategy to arrive at them could not have been divorced from the policy arrangements around debt relief. So the structural adjustment programs and the debt relief agreements which were then transformed into poverty reduction strategies became the strategy. All the African countries adopted similar policies of liberalization, of the reduction of state, of austerity, of massive commodity expansion in order to generate foreign exchange to pay the debt after it had been reduced, but also of massive privatization. Almost without exception, the policy framework under which MDGs were achieved was uniform. We must now examine also the conditions under which we should develop the strategies to build upon the MDGs and become either more ambitious or more pragmatic. There is a financial crisis affecting every single African country because of the level of openness, trade openness of each country. In the year 2000, we had just begun on a growth path. In the year 2012, we have nearly a decade of positive per capita growth. In 2012, the international financial institutions are heavily involved in rescuing European and other matured economies. And so we have one set of rules for the rich and one set of rules for the poor. The policy framework for adjustment for poor countries, including Africa, in 2012 has not differed at all from the period of the 1990s. African civil society is more matured, more complex, more organized, more restless. There are more educated 
unemployed, restless young people than in the period 1990s. In the period 2012, there are fewer military regimes and more democratic processes. But in the year 2012, there is also much more convergence between the economic elite and the political elite. Our economic situation has more potentials. We do not need anymore to become policy takers. Meaning, the policy space is there to take for ourselves. What that means is, we must start at the national local level to shape a governance arrangement which implies a true, honest, transparent, and realistic interaction between state and citizens. The purpose, the major purpose of state is to provide the spaces for freedom, rule of law, but to deliver tangible benefits, social services, to protect the poor through social protection, manage the environment, contain the powerful so that the weak have space, build an equitable and harmonious society. Because without equitable and harmonious society, our societies will fracture. Greater inequalities is not simply an economic issue. It is also at the heart of building stable democracies. Let's take post-2015 as a moment, an opportunity to renew the interaction between state, state institutions, citizens, the business sector, so it is shaped for both efficiency but also to serve society. When you talk governance, don't just talk the processes and the institutions. Let's talk the outcome. The outcome has got to be that people's lives are better, public services are delivered, that our society has protection. And how we build the institutions to arrive at that is part of the process of democratic deepening. Let's just don't talk corruption. Let's talk about how resources are used or misused because of their impact on the delivery of services, on the protection of the vulnerable, on our ability to feed ourselves, and our ability to create jobs. So when we talk governance, don't separate it from development. Then when we talk political institutions, they don't exist for their own purposes. They, you exist and we exist, parliaments exist, to serve the purpose of making life better and stable for our societies.